This is John Howell Essential Cuts, your daily rundown of the best of the best from today's show on 890 WLS. The NU hazing scandal, their football program, a little bit of trouble right now. Uh, Where do things stand legally today? Let's go to Andrew Stoltman. He's a Chicago attorney, also happens to be a law professor at Northwestern. So we're delicate with the questions. Mr. Stoltman, welcome back, sir. How are you? I'm well, thank you so much. Well, what does NU want the former AG, Loretta Lynch, to accomplish? I think Northwestern wants to get all the bodies out of the closet. She will find out whatever is there, whatever the alleged parade of horrible is that everybody and all the football players allegedly had to go through. She will find out what it is. She'll publish her report, and she will get that into the open. Parade of horrible. Excellent band name. <laughs> Not as good as Grateful Dead, but, but close. Other than recommendations, will she have any real power at all? No, she won't have any real power. She just She's kind of on a fact-finding mission to flush out all of the allegedly horrible conduct, get it out into the open. Dan Webb said it was a complete waste of money. Well, you know, Dan Webb has a vested interest. He's an amazing lawyer, and he also has a suit pending or an arbitration claim pending in effect against Northwestern. So I think he has a vested interest in keeping as many of the uh, horrific details buried and quiet. Now, Dan Webb said that uh, former coach Fitzgerald already had an outstanding due diligence program to detect hazing. So legally, is it necessary in your mind for NU just to scrap that existing policy and start from scratch? I don't think so. I, I mean, the fact that uh, Fitzgerald had a anti-hazing policy in place is a good thing for him, and it's actually a good thing for Northwestern. Now, the question is whether it was filled with more holes than a piece of cheese, and we just don't know that yet. I think everybody just needs to calm down, take a deep breath, and realize these are mere allegations at this point. Anyone can allege whatever they want in a lawsuit. Uh, against the school. So I think we will find out through discovery, uh, through, uh, you know, through the investigation as to what really happened. We just don't know for certain yet. I want to get back to that pacing issue here in a second. But first, in regards to Fitzgerald and his termination, they absolved him, or they said in that press release, the agreement when they were going to suspend him for two weeks, this is it. The agreement was he wasn't aware of any specific instance regarding hazing. Now, that may or may not be true, but that's problematic going forward for NU and any sort of settlement, right? It's absolutely uh, problematic for Northwestern. And I I think uh, Dan Webb will have that as exhibit number one in his exhibit book against Northwestern. So, yeah, the the school has to be careful what it says, and that will be used against it. That may have been a, a hasty decision. Now, talking with Andrew Stoltman, he's a Chicago attorney. He's also a law professor at Northwestern. How can NU control the pace and confidentiality of any investigation in this sort of environment where uh, additional uh, victims or uh, allegedly victims, they're coming forward, uh, it seems like uh, on a regular basis at this point, and it seems to be just running away from them. It's in NU's best interest to slow everything down, right? It is in their best interest to slow it down, but unfortunately, they don't control the pace. The genie is out of the bottle. The toothpaste is out of the tube. And at this point, they're kind of in bunker mentality. They have to let these allegations come out, take a deep breath, and then kind of regroup and figure out which direction they want to go with this. If you were advising NU, is it time to start talking about settling with Fitzgerald or hold off until Lynch's review is over? I personally would hold off because there's a lot of discovery that has to take place. Depositions have to take place. And I You know, the last thing you want to do as a university is make a knee-jerk reaction and pay money out before it's time. Go through discovery, take the depositions, see how bad the conduct allegedly is, and then make that determination. Um, Okay. Would you uh, take on the job of defending NU if asked? You know, absolutely. Look, the school has valid defenses. I'm not just saying this because I'm affiliated with the school, but there are always valid defenses. And the absolute worst thing you can do is settle the case initially on the front end before you get through discovery, because they do have defenses. It's just a matter for their legal team to come up with those defenses and present them to the judge or the arbitrator. Well, I appreciate your analysis as always. Thank you very much. Before I let you go, 
Today is National Book Lovers Day. If you had to recommend one book for other people to read, uh, which book would you recommend and why? Oh, what a question. I, I would say probably the book Walter Isaacson wrote on Steve Jobs. I, that's about the only book in the last 30 years that I've read twice. I'm a huge fan of Walter Jacobson, by the way, as a book coming out on Elon Musk yeah. very, very shortly. Mm-hmm. So that would be my recommendation. I've read his biography of Einstein, but not of Jobs. Oh, you'd love it. You'd love it. Great read. And uh, he has, you know, like a compilation out. I forgot what that title is, but it's basically excerpts from all of his biographies, which is, uh, you know, a little easier to take than, you know, 800 pages per subject. I'm going to have to pick that up then because I know he's written a bunch of a bunch of different uh, people. and Boy, what a great writer. Love him. Appreciate your time, Mr. Stolman. We'll talk to you again as this is the case and others develop. We appreciate making yourself available to our program. Thank you, John. You're listening to John Howell, Essential Cuts, on 890 WLS. Driving the news of the afternoon is the fact that Maui and the Big Island burning in Hawaii. Uh, this uh, started late last night. It's become a huge event with, uh, I think, six or eight people now who have died because of this. It's still not under control. Alex Stone is watching this in L.A. on behalf of ABC News and joins us now. Alex, what's the latest? Hey there, John. Yeah, the the number uh, six who have been killed at this point and uh, from early on, the flames are moving so quickly, just like we've seen when the big wildfires are burned in California and elsewhere, that when the wind is 80 miles an hour, that means the flames are moving at 80 miles an hour and people just cannot escape those flames. And it's sounding like this. That is what has been whipping across Maui into Lahaina, the community that people know really well. If you've been to Maui, you've probably stayed in Canapali or the the resorts in that area and people go to to Lahaina for uh, dinner and they you know, to go shopping the the main street front street there most of that appears now to be gone to uh, have been completely wiped out by these fires not a lot left and today officials on Maui they are saying please they want the tourists to leave they need hotel rooms to house Maui residents shelters are overflowing Maui is busy right now with so many people who are visiting, they want them to leave. The planes that are coming in, they don't want more people coming in. If you have a vacation, you're going to go Chicago to Maui tonight. Uh, the, the mayor and the governor are saying, no, thank you. Typically, Hawaii doesn't say that because all their money comes from tourism. But they are saying not right now that, that they just can't handle it. And the lieutenant governor is saying, as of this morning, um, Planes were landing on Maui with tourists. Um, this is not a safe place to be. On uh, certain parts of Maui, we have shelters that are overrun. We have resources that are being taxed. Um, we are doing whatever we can. They have declared that emergency communications are very spotty. 911 service is not working. The National Guard has been activated. Uh, many of the National Guard members, John, were in Louisiana training, so they're having to use helicopters from the active duty uh, Army to to go in and help out. Uh, but it is a, it's a mess right now, and there are a number of fires burning on Maui and on the Big Island. The worst ones in the most populated areas are in Maui, uh, on Maui, and and they have probably another 24 hours of strong winds, hot, very dry. You know, you think of they're in the middle of the ocean that there would be humidity in the air. It's a lot like California right now would would be during the fire season of 10 percent humidity, 95 degrees, 80 mile an hour winds. And the the flames have been taking off. And and now we know they were deadly. But in California, it seems to be kind of an annual occurrence, your dry season, your wildfire season. Is this unprecedented in Hawaii? They do have grass fires, but anything like this, at least in the current lifetime, people are saying they, they've never seen anything like this. And to be driving in to the most populated, the most tourist areas, well, here, Michaela, she lives on Maui. I've been talking to some of my firefighter friends who've been doing this on Maui for decades, and they have never had a situation like this before. The magnitude of those winds being with gusts up to 80 miles per hour. We've just never seen anything like it. The the wind would knock you down. It it was hurricane force winds, which is wild because the hurricane is so far away. I would not be surprised if firefighters from California begin heading that way. Those who can be spared who, uh, in case anything breaks out in California, to help out because they have limited resources in, in Hawaii. You have aircraft and, and ground crews and experience fighting big wildfires. That They're going to need that help. And again, 
Yeah, still planes are going into Maui, and today we talked to some folks who were on one of the planes that, that was flying out of LAX, and one guy said, you know what, I'll deal with it. I'll sleep in my rental car if I need to or go sleep in a shelter. Other people had no idea what was going on, but uh, that's not the Hawaiian vacation you want, that you're going to sleep in a rental car. The, the Maui is saying, do not go, that um, the shelters are full. They need the hotel rooms for, for Maui residents. They don't want people going. So is it just the Big Island, or are all the other islands impacted? Well, it's uh, Maui, and then also the the Big Island uh, has wildfires, but uh, that's a brunt of it. Uh, Oahu, not so much. Kauai, not so much. Uh, but it but it's mainly Maui. Maui is the big tourist island with all of the they all have resorts, but Maui has the resorts for that that many people uh, enjoy and and go to and Kanapali and Waialea and some other areas. But Lahaina is where you go and get a drink, where you go and and shop, where you have dinner and you have music that's playing and and everybody having fun. That is gone. So that's that's the historic district you were referencing? Yeah, the historic area, yeah. All right, well, thanks for the update. Nobody saw this coming. Did they anticipate this yesterday or the day before? No, not really. They knew it was going to be windy. There's been a hurricane, I think it's Dora, that, that is pretty far to the south. A lot of weather folks are saying isn't really playing a role in this. This is not related to that, even though local officials keep saying it is. They knew it was going to be windy. They get a lot of winds, the trade winds, but uh, these fires, they had no idea. Uh, Thanks for popping on. Appreciate it. You got it. Thanks, John. Alex Stone, ABC News in Los Angeles. This is John Howell Essential Cuts on 890 WLS. All right, the MAPES trial is underway. An attorney for uh, Michael Madigan's longtime chief of staff, I think the better part of 20 years, likened Mr. MAPES' 2021 visit to a federal grand jury to a high school reunion featuring a pop quiz in which failure results in a felony. That's the opening line in my next guest piece, which he writes for the Sun-Times. He posted this just after 3 o'clock. It's been a long day. For John Seidel, it was a long day for Mr. Mapes, apparently, when he testified for hours in 2021. He was asked more than 650 questions by prosecutors. And today, apparently, they say he allegedly lied on seven occasions out of 650 questions. Let's start there with John Seidel. That seems like a reach for the feds, John. Is that basically what uh, the defense team said today? Yeah, I mean, that's the message the defense wants uh, to, to get across, that this was, you know, these were seven isolated in, incidents in, in, in hours of, of testimony. And, and look, that, that, that high school prom comparison, imagine like showing up and you're, you're being asked about your, 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 what color corsage you wore to the prom, who your friend had a crush on freshman year. And, and they're saying that he simply just in that moment didn't know or didn't remember. And they also want to stress that this was an intimidating setting. These this grand jury process, you know, it's a very secretive process. You have to go in there without your lawyer. And another thing that uh, the defense lawyer said today was that this was not the time to speculate or to guess. And in, on these occasions, he said he didn't know or couldn't recall. And they're saying that those were his honest answers in that moment. So that, that's the uh, that's the line, Poor says. Where does the obstruction come in? Well, there's also several other topics that they say that he he falsely testified about. Um, just, but their their point is that he was trying to protect Madigan and and, and sensibly Michael McLean as well. You know, the prosecutors opened their argument today, quoting uh, what we presume is a wiretap uh, recording of of Mates talking about you know we're, he's he's going to be he's going to protect Madigan, he's going to protect the boss, and that's what they're arguing to jurors that he did in the grand jury. And just real quick to, to counter what the defense is saying, um, they're, they're, the, the government is arguing these were not like very random specific questions like the color of your corsage at the prom. These were open general questions. Did you know of any work being done by Michael McLean for, for Michael Madigan during this time period? And I think what the government wants to put forward with the wiretaps is that this was Tim Mates's world. He was he, this was all around him, and he was very close with Michael McLean, so it strains credibility to think that he didn't know what was going on. But he was offered qualified immunity or something of that nature initially. Then the feds uh, took that back. So, But if they already had the wiretaps and they sat him down uh, for this uh, long uh, question-and-answer session and then rescinded their initial offer, 
I guess he just decided not to become a cooperating witness, correct? And that, that's why they brought him, that's why they nailed, threw him these charges on him. Well, to be clear, he, there, there was an immunity order handed down by Chief Judge Rebecca Paul Meyer before Mapes went into the grand jury. And the chief judge admonished Mr. Mapes as he went into the grand jury that he, w- he was ordered to testify. Nothing he could be used, nothing that he said before that grand jury could be used against him unless he lied or otherwise didn't follow the order. So he, he did have immunity. Um, and if <laughs> the, what the government says is true, that he lied, uh, he, he basically threw that away because, yeah, they, they, you're right, they knew they knew this information. They wanted his testimony, and he refused to give it to them. This comes down to what we're talking about regarding uh, a former president. If you truly believe it, then it can't be a lie. The George Costanza defense. <laughs> yeah, it seems that we've got another example of that here. Um, and, and look, the, the defense attorneys, it, it was an interesting day. I think the, the defense had a, had a good opening. Um, you know, they, they made clear that there will be no direct evidence that in 2021, Mapes knew that he was giving false testimony, that he knew this stuff, that, that he knew it, but claimed he couldn't recall. But you're not going to find a wiretap in 2021 where he gets on the phone with McLean and says, don't worry, I didn't give him the good stuff. Um, the defense says that doesn't exist. Uh, you know, but we'll see. I think the government has a lot of evidence to bring forward. Oh, yeah, they always do, don't they? They always do. They always do. Yeah. 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 You know. the, the odds are in their favor. It was like Blago. Remember Blago? Play all the tapes. Play all the tapes. There are thousands of tapes. They can't play there all are. the tapes. There are. Yeah. No, it's true. And, and yeah, we've looked. This is um, – <laughs> I'm losing track. It's the third or fourth corruption trial we've seen this year. Uh, the government hasn't seen a not guilty yet. I think there have been some very spirited defenses. Um, but, yeah, six people have already been convicted as a result of these investigations so far this year. Uh, Mapes is trying to avoid being the seventh. I think his defense attorneys had a good day, but there's a lot more to come. Was Bob Rita there today? Yeah, he was. we saw him in the building. He's expected to be a witness. He, he's been called in some of these other trials as well. They, they did, we did not hear from him today, though. We heard from uh, former state representative uh, Greg Harris. Uh, who uh, told jurors a little bit about the Illinois General Assembly and about a conversation he had with Michael McLean in 2018. And we also heard from Tom Cullen, uh, who is a lobbyist who once worked for Michael Madigan. John Seidel is here, sometimes federal court reporter, graciously giving of his time on a very busy day here, talking about the MAPES trial. Did the, did the judge quash one uh, wiretap that they want to play today? Yeah, that's true. So there, I mentioned a conversation that Greg Harris had with, with Michael McLean. This was in November 2018. I believe uh, Barbara Flynn Curry had decided to step down. She had been the majority leader in the House. Uh, Greg Harris had interest in that position. And he talked to Michael McLean about his interest in becoming majority leader. And he did eventually become majority leader. Michael McLean told him in that call that uh, he should talk to Michael Madigan about it. Um, you know, The government wanted to play it to show that Michael McLean, you know, was – you know, people sought advice from Michael McLean, and he gave advice to those people. Um, the judge just didn't find it relevant. He, he said relevance is a low bar. He did not think that that tape cleared even that low bar. So um, Representative Harris testified about that conversation, but we did not hear the tape. Uh, what's next? What's on the uh, docket for tomorrow? Uh, you know, it's not clear, although we are watching for Bob Rita, and he uh, said he was in the building today, so presumably that he's uh, uh, on deck. Um, you know, another witness that I'm watching for is uh, Gary Shapiro, the former acting U.S. attorney. He's expected at some point to come in and explain the grand jury process to these trial jurors. Um, you would assume that would be earlier in the trial than later, but it's not clear when he's coming in yet. Um, I think we're also watching for uh, former state representative Lou Lang, who testified in the ComEd trial. And uh, Will Cousineau is another former Madigan aide who's expected to testify. There's several others, too. But it's just not clear exactly who the next witnesses are going to be tomorrow. Yeah. Does Mapes himself, does he seem uh, rattled or does he seem stoic? You might say more stoic than rattled. But, I, I mean, he's he, he's there. He's, he's taking uh, close notes, paying close attention. I think he is involved and wants to be involved in the defense. I saw him, you know, interacting with his attorneys. Um, you know, I mean... I think once people get here, they want to they want to put on a good face, right? You know, like he's holding up, um, but this is not a this is not a place where you want to be. You can't be happy to be here, yeah. uh, no matter what image he wants to project. Yeah, feds usually win, don't they? They do. Yeah. I mean, well, we'll you know, but we're waiting waiting to see, and then it's until proven guilty. 
I agree. Yes, presumption of innocence. Uh, today yep. is a National Book Lovers Day. If you had to recommend one book, John Seidel, to a friend, family member, coworker, what book would that be, and why? You know, I was thinking about it. The book that popped into my head was um, Inga: The Rise and Fall of Chicago's First Black Banker, which was written a few years ago by former Chicago Sun Times editor Don Hainer. It's a it's a really good read about uh, um, kind of a more obscure figure in our history, and uh, frankly, his his downfall as well. So uh, that will be my recommend, recommendation. I missed the title. Uh, One more time. It's called Binga, the Rise and Fall of Chicago's First Black Banker by Don Hainer. Okay. Terrific. Thanks, John. I hope we can call on your uh, expertise again. Uh, absolutely. Call Take care. Time. You're listening to John Howell, Essential Cuts on 890 WLS. Now that the writer's strike is 100 days old, Hollywood producers are relying on reality shows to fill their schedules, but there's a lot of drama on and off of these shows. I played the clips from Big Brother just before the news. Let's start with that one. Jason Nathanson joins us. Hi, Jason. How are you, sir? I'm good. Thank you. How are you? Can you give my listeners a background on Big Brother and what one contestant is under fire for saying? Yeah, Big Brother, and it seems like this happens almost every season in the 25-year history of the show. The basic premise is you get a bunch of strangers, you put them in a house, and you watch them for 90 or so days. It's been a big summertime hit. It's always a big hit for CBS. Um, and then on you know three times a week, they show a kind of a condensed version of what happens in the house as people scheme to vote each other out and things like that. And it seems almost every season there's something involving race, whether somebody says something uh, against another person when it comes to race, uh, somebody says a racial, racial slur. There's always something that happens, and people watch this on the live feed. They watch the 24-7 live <laughs> feed of the show, so everything these people say is caught on camera. CBS has not done a great – had uh, in the past, they haven't done a great job of addressing these things during the show. Sometimes they just let them happen off camera and then don't address it on the show. Most people watch the show. They're, we're not sitting around watching the live feed. You know, huge big-time fans are, but most people are not. So there's been this weird dis- disparity between stuff that happens off camera on the show or, or off, uh, you know, the main broadcast – and people are watching it, and then it's not addressed on the main broadcast. This is a little different. So the show, by the way, just started last week, so it's very fresh into the season. And contestant Luke Valentine was coming in. Uh, he's a white guy. He comes in. Uh, he's talking to there are four people in the room. Um, he's, I'm not clear of the context exactly what he's talking about, um, but he says the N word, and it's not directed at. He doesn't call somebody. It's not you know. That's yeah, not angry. Inc- I played right. it. Yeah, it's he's, just kind of casual. Not, he's just saying it as, you know, somebody would if they were, you know, in a, if they were culturally able to say it. Um, <laughs> he is not He is not that's, one of those people. That's a perfect way to describe it, yes. sure. Uh, so he's yeah. he's talking about it in conversation. The, there, there are two other white guys uh, who, are, who are next to him. Their faces go like, oh, okay, and they pretty much leave uh, and leave the room almost immediately. Yeah. Jared Fields, another contestant who is black, is in the room, and Luke immediately realizes, you can see, oh, yeah, I, I just said something I should not have said. Uh, he apologizes. Everybody kind of tries to laugh it off. Um, and then Jared Fields seems to be able to, like, he, he's not mad at, at Luke for saying it yeah. necessarily. I don't know what's going on in his head. And then the feed cuts out, and that's the end of it. And I hear they cashiered that the contestant, correct? They, I'm sorry, what? Did they fire him, pull him off yes. the show? Yeah. Yes, they they did they, they just within the last hour or so put out a statement saying that that violates their code of conduct. They have the um, um, he has gone from the show and they will address it. They say on Thursday's episode, so it is going to make the main show. Well, yeah, and it's 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 ricocheting around the old uh, you know you, you Twitterverse now. Obviously, you know sure. a lot of my listeners will say, "Well, what about Chris Rock? Well, what about uh, rap stars?" Blah, 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 blah. And you're right. If you're if you have the license to use that term culturally, you can. If you don't, you can't. Simple as that. What about this below deck show, which is another reality show? And I guess one of the department heads was this a uh, producer or somebody working for the production company fired no. for essentially assaulting uh, a coworker. The, this was somebody who they who was a not contestant, but somebody who works who who were there filming on the reality show Below Deck. If you if you're not sure, it's a Bravo reality show. It, it focuses on the crew of a super yacht 
uh, the people who are taking care of the super rich as they go on these vacations. And so you have the deck crew, who are the people who do the outside stuff, and you have the interior crew, who are the people who are doing the servers. Most often those jobs are uh, women in those positions, um, and uh, that's the case on this season. It's all women doing the interior. Um, they're serving drinks and you know making beds and things like that. And very often on this show, there are relationships between the the interior and the exterior or whoever. The guys and girls, you know, you're in close quarters. They go, they have relationships, whatever. There are a couple. <laughs> um, there are a couple of the crew members. Uh, the the guy who was the head, Luke, who was he was the head of the the exterior crew and Laura, who was one of the junior stews, the two of them had kind of hooked up a little bit in the, in the beginning of the season. They weren't sure. They're kind of feeling things out on this last episode, which aired on Monday. The whole crew goes out. They get obliterated drunk, which happens all the time. So uh, and one of the the boss of Laura, she sees that Luke is kind of looking at, at Laura a little like with predator eyes and Laura's really drunk. They put her to bed, and so she's in her bed, and uh, Luke, who is the guy, eventually makes his way down to her bedroom where she's passed out. He goes in there naked and attempts to get into the bed with her, and at that point, the crew, the, the film crew, intervenes and goes, dude, no, and they try to pull him out of the cabin. Um, and But up you know, until both- that point, they were just filming this whole episode? Correct. Up until that point, yeah. and nothing, nothing, you know, had, yeah. had necessarily crossed the line. Right. People were just people were just drunk and doing drunk things. But the line gets crossed <laughs> when you yeah. go into a crew member's room naked and try to get in bed yeah. with her. That's now, if you, you know, don't intervene, you're an accessory. Correct. Yeah. And they have it all on film and 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 blah blah blah. And I think we they've learned a lot. In you know, a lot of these shows have learned a lot in, the, in over the years because the, at one point I could see them just letting that happen, mm-hmm. and and you know, not I don't know about raping her. I don't think that they would they would stand by while that happened. But getting into bed with her, I could see you know if this were ten years ago, they would film that and yeah. not intervene. Now they intervene, and then he got fired the next day. Do you get the sense that it gives writers a little leverage considering they've been out 100 days? Hey, you better bring us back on board to, you know, maybe put some guardrails on these shows. Yeah, yes or no? I don't know. We're talking about two reality shows, which you and I don't really normally talk about reality right. shows, um, which is good for the reality shows. It's good for the audience and on those shows. And the, the, the at least the Below Deck, I'm, I, I, I will admit I'm a fan of Below Deck. It was it was a very compelling episode to watch and to watch then the reactions of everybody afterwards and just, you know, completely incensed and uh, and things like that. Um, But these are two shows, Big Brother and Below Deck. These are two shows that are popular franchises anyway. Writer Striker. No, these are popular franchises that are always running every year. Interestingly, about Big Brother, Big Brother just started last week. Normally it would have started earlier in the summer. But CBS pushed it back knowing that they would need stuff to fill Mm -hmm. come prime time, come September and October. So Big Brother is now going to run into October at least. Um, So, you know, they're using that to kind of shore up their network schedules. And it doesn't seem, you know, like you said, this is the 100th day of the writer's strike. It doesn't seem like there's any movement on either side. And this could last for a lot, a lot longer. Ballpark, you ever figure out how many hours a week you're on the screen? That I'm watching stuff. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I've never. I, I I feel like I'd be depressed if I actually sat down <laughs> and thought about it. But yeah, I wow. I would I would think after work, on average, I'm watching probably three hours of something, whether it's a movie or TV shows, yeah. every day, and then you know stuff on weekends as well. Yeah, for you, I, just luckily, never ends. I, like trying to drink I from like, a fire hose. <laughs> Yes, luckily I like it. Um, I, I have to say, in the in, since streaming started, there's a lot of shows, yeah, man. That's too there's much. A lot of stuff to watch. It's too much. Uh, Jason Nathanson, thanks for popping on. We appreciate it, sir. Sure thing. Take, Take care. care. John Howell, Essential Cuts. Check back every weekday for another episode of John Howell, Essential Cuts on eight ninety WLS.